Today, you and I are going to take the T1 cargo bike on a bit of an adventure, as we condense one month of experience into our first impressions. The T1's design seems pretty clear to me that they focused heavily on comfort and practicality. Yeah, I'll be covering this bike's unique features, areas that I feel can be improved, and what I think they got right. So whether your needs consist of heavy-duty urban transportation or reliably and stealthily moving through the harsh back roads, I'll do my best to show you this bike's capabilities and limitations. At first glance, the T1 cargo bike might look like a bit of an oddball compared to the other pieces of equipment that Fido puts out onto the market with a very unique and distinctive design choice, the T1 almost looks adopted. This company is definitely not afraid to try new things as they even have an off-road two-wheel drive scooter that crosses territory into electric go-karts. One thing's for sure, it's definitely nice to see a company like this let their engineers actually have some fun and create these interesting ideas. And although the T1 has definitely not escaped cost-cutting corners, which we'll cover in a moment, it's clear that whoever's designed this bike actually rides bikes. As sometimes when I review things, it feels like they just put it together and said, yeah, that looks like a bike, go ahead and sell it. This is definitely not the case with the T1. So let's go ahead and start out with a few of the nitpicks and areas I think they could make this bike even better. First, the seat. The nose is a bit too wide to make pedaling practical in pretty much any situation. There is a little leeway to adjust the seat forward or backwards, and it might help some riders. I just found the nose to be too big to pedal this bike. Now, I thought I should point that out because a lot of people, and myself included, like applying pedal assistance, but we'll come back to the seat later because there's a lot of good things going for it. For instance, it's attached to a quick flip-up mechanism, which allows you to easily remove the battery for convenience without messing with your seat post height. If you decide you do want to apply pedal assistance and change out the seat, you can keep the flip-up design, you just loosen these two little nuts right here and slide on your new seat. And also keep in mind, if you want to add your own custom suspension seat post, this is a very large post. It's 33.9 millimeters. They do have them, just it's larger than most bikes. And second would go into the heads-up display. It's lack of options, very poor quality when it comes to visibility, and normally simplicity would not be an issue, but this goes uh, into the absolute bare minimum. Granted, you find yourself in lighting conditions where you can actually see what's on the display, which is almost never, it wouldn't matter anyways because you can make absolutely no custom changes to this bike. Last on our list of things that they could definitely improve is this bike really should have come with hydraulic disc brakes. I can generally overlook this. Modern mechanical brakes are pretty good, and the ones on this bike actually have great performance, but this bike's intended purpose is probably going to appeal to a heavy rider who wants to carry moderate levels of cargo. This is going to put a lot of stress on the brakes. Not in a way that they might fail, just requiring constant adjustment, especially if you use it every day. Now, there's a lot of positives about this bike, which might overshadow that and have you consider just upgrading them yourself, but with this bike coming in at the $1,700 price point, that's no longer in a category that can justify mechanicals. Show you guys the brakes real quick. At 18 miles an hour. Really good brakes. They're, they're full mechanical, but they're 
about the best mechanical brakes I've ever felt. Now we'll go ahead and move on to our neutral thoughts and just as a quick explanation is what's covered in this category, my neutral thoughts are key things about the bike which may affect other riders in a positive or negative way but generally don't affect me at all. Or they could be items which have both a positive aspect about them and a negative. For example, this bike has cruise control, which on almost any other bike would have been in the positive section, except the PID settings in this speed controller make it so that this cruise control is very inefficient. I find any time I'm on a long, flat stretch of road with the cruise control active, any time the bike drops below its predetermined speed, it pretty much applies full throttle to jump you back up to that speed, and then it reaches it and shuts off the motor completely. Now, it doesn't always do this. If there's a mild incline or a downhill, obviously you don't have to worry about it, but you will notice these fluctuations pulsating you back and forth on long stretches of flat road. So you lose some efficiency there just because it's eating away at the battery. Out of all the nitpicks on this bike, that's the one that bugs me the most because I'm familiar with PID loops and speed controllers and I know this is a configuration issue that they could have fixed before releasing the bike. I can't do it myself because I don't have anything to work with on this heads up display. There's nothing. Second neutral thought, the front rack, which is very sturdy and robust, borderline over-engineered, it's solid steel framework. And this makes it heavy. For its size, really heavy. Eh, nothing deal breaking, but I assume they just did this to save cost, as an aluminum bike rack would have probably cost more money. However, it would have been a lot lighter. And unless you plan on carrying a full grown adult's worth of weight in the front of your bike, I can't justify this much strength. Though I do find it quite convenient, especially for carrying my lunch, so I am glad it's there. Now on to my positive opinions about this bike and where I think they just got it right. At first glance, the simplistic design and drab green color of this bike made me think it wasn't going to win any beauty contest. Aside from my custom gas bike builds, this has received the most amount of compliments and questions from my fellow co-workers, and I'm not really sure why. My best guess is, practicality has some role to play when people notice this particular bike. Looks aside, let's go ahead and talk about some of the choices they made on this bike which make it stand out among other cookie cutter designs. Starting with the power system, they definitely had cargo and heavy riders in mind because even though this is only a 48 volt system, it accelerates like my 52 volt Magicycle Cruiser. Up until now, the Engine Pro was the fastest accelerating fat tire folding bike I had which would be the closest thing I could relate to this bike. But I believe that they have gear the hub motor down to give it more torque and acceleration and this shows because it only gives a top speed of 25 miles an hour once unlocked which is about three miles an hour slower than most other e-bikes when fully unlocked however it gets there very quickly this has a lot of pull for a 48 volt e-bike and just to be clear even though it's a little slower in the top speed because this thing is just designed to be a practical hauler I find that torque to be much more useful than top speed They've paired the power system up to a 20 amp hour battery, which for consumer e-bikes is pretty big. And this gave me a tested range of just over 30 miles of mixed riding conditions. I took it on some gravel roads, long flat stretches, keeping it at about 18 miles an hour for most of my trip. And because we don't pedal this bike due to the seat's complexity, this is throttle only range. Should you decide to upgrade your seat and give it some assistance, expect much more. And despite the heads-up display being a bit lackluster, it does have two good things going for it. There's a USB charging port hidden underneath, which is great for the range you can get on this bike. And the battery bar indicator, as far as I can tell, appears to be accurate, if you can see it in just the right lighting. It doesn't have a reverse exponential curve that stays at 100% for half your trip, suddenly dropping down, leaving you stranded. It appears to have a linear curve, dropping down correctly. The T1's lighting system is bar none the absolute best I've tested on an electric vehicle so far. It looks like they just ripped this straight off a motorcycle. It has a true high and low beam that's not a gimmick. The high beam will shoot quite a ways down the road. Well beyond your top speed, you can travel safely in pitch black situations. And the low beam will actually keep you from blinding oncoming motorists because this is a bright light. The low beam has a very wide pattern as well, which lets you see everything around you. Good job, Fido, on putting a usable headlight on a bike that's going to be traveling at speeds which require a usable headlight. 
Though I should point out that out of the box, I couldn't get it adjusted high enough to be really usable. It was pointed way too far down, and the two screws that hold on the plastic shroud prevented me from pointing it up any further. Now I wanted to get it high enough not to blind motorists, but to actually take advantage of its full potential. So I removed these two screws, and I just kept that shroud from rattling around with a bit of black Gorilla Tape. There's probably a more elegant solution for this, but it's a rugged bike, so I really don't care. On to comfort, and there's actually a few things that go into this bike that you won't notice at a glance which really affect its comfort, but let's get the obvious ones out of the way first. Now I know we gave the seat a bit of a hard time, but that's only when it comes to pedal assistance. Yes, it's not very easy to pedal with this seat, however, if you don't care about pedaling and you just want to treat this like a scooter, well you're in luck, because this is a very comfortable seat. It has a lot of cushy padding, some nice coiled springs, and it's combined with a suspension seat post right out the box. If you're not going to pedal, there's really no reason to change this out. The suspension seat post is also adjustable for its preload, so if you're a really heavy rider you can crank down on this quite a bit. It does take a rather large Allen key that I didn't have, so I got a bit creative and made it work. A lot of personal preference goes into handlebars for each rider. Me personally, I'm six foot four, and these have just enough reach to keep me comfortable, I don't feel hunched over, and I have enough support on my shoulders to happily carry my backpack whenever I'm on these long rides. They even went one step above what most companies do with the grips, and they decided not to use the annoying faux leather grips that get hot and rotate. These ones aren't perfect, they will rotate just a little bit under long rides, but they're a lot better than the alternative. The next best option would be lock-on grips, but these are pretty good and I think I'm going to keep them. Now of course you've got the 4 inch fat tires which do a lot for soaking up the bumps, but in this category there's a lot of fat tire bikes so it's kind of a given. But I know there's some first timers who have never ridden a fat tire bike so you'll be in for a pleasant surprise. With this bike's utility in mind over off-roading capabilities, they decided to use a smooth tread pattern to give better grip on streets, a quieter ride, and a lot smoother. This is a very smooth bike to ride, and the few times I did ride it in wet conditions, I found that this tread pattern did not flick up nearly as much road debris as the alternatives. Which is good because the front fender on this particular bike is smaller than you'll find on most fat tire bikes. However, they decided to use plastic fenders, and kudos, I like plastic plastic fenders over metal. They're just safer in my opinion, they're more reliable, and they don't make as much noise. You do get a little bit of tapping from the chain on the rear fender when you're on really bumpy conditions, but I mean, if you're riding on bumpy conditions, you've got to accept some sacrifices. You could probably do something to fix it, but I didn't find a need to. Hands down best forks I've tested on an electric bike so far. These are hydraulic, and I think they even have rebound, as I get absolutely no annoying clunks when I'm over rough terrain. Very smooth, and they do a really good job at soaking up those bumps. Now because I'm not an expert when it comes to bike geometry, this might be hard to visualize, so I'll do my best. The headset angle on this bike helps to complement the forks and make your ride even more comfortable. On some bikes, you may notice under bumpy terrain that the forks really don't do all that much, and that's not always because they're low quality forks. This bike's headset angle is just right to when you hit pretty much any obstacle, the forks are able to engage at their full potential which is really nice, so that's good engineering right there. Or they just got lucky, but either way, it works. All right, so it's a cargo bike. Let's talk about that rear rack. Terrible idea. Huh. You know what? Get some, uh, get some big ape hangers and pull them back. A nice cushion on the rack. <laughs> you might be onto something here. Being a dedicated cargo bike, the rear rack is not just attached to the frame, it's actually part of the frame, so it's not an afterthought and can support quite a bit of weight, 80 kilograms to be exact, or just over 175 pounds for my what's a kilogram riders. With the seat being rated up to 260 pounds, you're looking at an all-up weight loaded down of 440 pounds. Now, Obviously, these are max rated capacity, and your performance is probably going to suck with that much weight, but if you had to do it, it's nice to know that you could, because that's a lot of weight. I didn't see any specifications for the front rack, but being all steel as we discussed earlier, I think if it fits, it ships. 
And don't let its convenient step-through design fool you, this is a sturdy build, as with all e-bikes I've tested. I don't feel any flex being a step-through design, and no reason to think that this is going to fail. Obviously, you won't be doing extreme off-roading with this bike, because that's not what it's for, but you can definitely handle some of the rough stuff. And I've been informed that they're going to release a waterproof cargo box to fit into the frame if you would like to sacrifice your convenient step-through option for more cargo capacity. Well, this will be nice to see. So let's go ahead and sum up my first impressions about the T1 cargo bike from Fido. Although I've personally found no deal breakers, the critic inside me says that at this price point, they need to give it hydraulic disc brakes, a better heads-up display, and they need to adjust the settings in the speed controller so that the cruise control is more efficient and it doesn't keep pulsating back and forth under long flat road conditions. And although this is a difficult bike to try and pedal, I find the seat and suspension post combination to be so comfortable that I wouldn't really want to sacrifice it for anything else. I find that the positives on this bike far outweigh the few negatives that I could find. Its power, range, comfort, smooth ride, and cargo carrying capacity are just really good. It does exactly what it's supposed to do, and their choice of critical components like the front suspension, tires, the power, and the motor along with its gear ratio, it just complements everything really well. And even though this is a bike that you might consider only for practicality, make no mistake, it was a lot of fun on the back roads. And I'd also like to point out that not only can that rear rack support quite a bit of weight, it's also a pretty long rack with a low center of gravity. Low center of gravity is good for stability, but the longer rack also means you can carry the larger baskets, or the giant panniers on this thing, without them interfering. Good job. So, I hope you guys got some useful information out of today's video, or at the very least, were mildly entertained. And until next time, ride safe.